Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. What's up, Jim Bros? We are What's here up? today with the crew and John Jewett. What's going on, guys? Not too much. What's up? Thanks for coming on, John. Yeah, thanks for having me. Ho it's, hopefully, uh, we're not too light, low class for you. You're you're way classier than we are. I'll I'll try to keep my nose turn up to a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Jim Bro, man. That's I'm, just like everyone, all you guys. I just uh, happen to compete, you know. At another at a, at a high level, right? Yeah, um, I compete uh, at a at a moderate level. <laughs> Todd's a pro. Yeah, I mean, in name, <laughs> in name, <laughs> in name. I've done one show. I'm, I'm going to do a pro qualifier here in a couple months, so we'll we'll see how it goes. But I'm I'm out there with the old guys, so it's the it's the pro card with the asterisk next next to it. Will that be North uh, North Americans? I'm going to do the uh, Masters USA's in Anaheim. Oh, uh, right on. Yeah, in November, so we'll we'll see how it goes. But I'm almost 50 years old, so <laughs> we'll we'll see how it goes. So uh, thanks for coming on, John. We we really appreciate it, man. I, I've been a member of God J3s since I think since almost the start. Uh, when, right on. when you when you first put it up, it was yeah, great content. It's probably the best assembled. Uh, you know, you re really put a lot of thought into it. It's the best assembled. Uh, PED and training and nutrition education that I've seen for bodybuilding. It's really, really well put together. No, thank you for that. And for, for all you guys supporting it, it's, it, you know, initially it was just, I wanted a hub to have my clients to have education material because you keep repeating yourself to everyone. Right. Yep. And then I, I got with my business partner, Mark Fox. He's like, this sounds more like a kind of like an education hub. And he's like a kind of like a place to learn, like a school. I was like, yeah, I guess so. And then it formulated to like, why don't you, we only make this kind of this university course. I'm like, oh, well, I didn't really think of it like that. He really helped kind of hone in what I was trying to do. And it, it, it had like two years of failing with other web developers. And uh, that's a whole mess to find the right guy behind it. Yep. And uh, he, he had the organized system to make it really clean and layout. But it ended up kind of being, yeah, an A to Z of bodybuilding. And he kept telling me, John, just make the minimal viable product, right? Because I don't think I ever would have finished it because there's still more I'm going back to to hone in on. And like questions, I get all these questions in the forums like, man, I wasn't I wasn't clear on this one area of how I felt. And to try to go back and also bring greater clarity to to things that I mean, because now I get kind of stamped like, well, this is the J3U protocol. I'm like, man, no, it's not like that. I wanted a, a framework of thought to, so, to help guide people make decisions on their own. For, for like self coaching or coaching others, but anyway, yeah. Thanks for uh, for diving into my early, the early one. It should be uh, continued developing on, along the way. Yeah, I need to check back in. I haven't looked at it in a while. I'm sure a lot of stuff has changed. I plowed through pretty much everything early on, but I've been at this a long time. Got off and on for 30 years, and and you know just a recreational bodybuilder. But it, I, I thought it was the best assembled um, bit of content that I'd seen on 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 comprehensively on, on bodybuilding um so when you uh you turned pro what 2015 correct uh 2016 at USA. 2016 yeah you had that huge jump from 2015 to 2016 like hey, you see people like they have that year yeah. where they just take that huge leap forward what what differently happened that year this was the picture yeah that oh man that one blew up on on ig that was yeah 2015, I was a middleweight. Um, of course, weighed in right at 176. And I, I was ready at 184. And that's when I, I Jansen took me on on that prep 12 weeks out from USA. So he's like, man, I'm really worried about making you that, getting you in condition. And I was 184. He's like, hey, I think if you push the middles, you probably have your best shot here. So we just sucked down. And man, I, I looked just cachectic, but prior to like carving up. <laughs> 
so so yeah, that's the like to to give people like some scale weight change perspective. Um, and then I came back one year later, and I weighed in at two fifteen as a heavy. No, <laughs> it's a big difference. It's a 30 yeah. pound, 40 pound jump, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, keep in mind one, one weight is sucking down. The other right. one's not sucking down. So, I mean, whatever, some people are giving you shit about it's not 35 pounds. It's 30 pounds. Like whatever, man, it was still a lot of stage weight. <laughs> um, yeah. I ended up weighing in that like morning of show, like at two Oh nine. So just, just so people know too, you can win classes of not being at the top of the class, right. but yeah, coming coming out of 2015 for that show, I just took like 30. I used a growth hormone and a bunch of Lant- bunch of Lantis, and that was. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Roman Roman might drop uh, jump in later. That that I think that's his Roman protocol. Yeah. <laughs> Roman would agree with that protocol. No, uh, I think differences there. For one, I I'd never been truly stage lean for 2015, so mm-hmm. I was in this extremely like sensitive state um also this is the first time that i had real coaching so everything was just put together well like matt we had like training was watched over um when to push food when not to push food i, I think just the whole thing was like pieced together uh, I, I asked derek lunsford about him and honey and that's that's kind of what he had said he's like dude everything was just like everything's looked out for and that was with matt now I had never like pushed food so hard post show either. So like a thing with Matt was like right away food came up substantially, like what I was doing refeed days with. And I had never done f- high food like that post show. It was just kind of like, I just eat. I try, would try to stay relatively lean and PEDs would come down as well. So with Matt, we kept in probably like, I mean, I have to look back, but maybe it was like half of what we were doing just injectable wise um, orals were gone and I think it was like a test EQ type of combo. Um, growth hormone. It was the first time that I used growth hormone, like in a prep, i never used it in an off season. So now this was in place for this post-show period. And there we were using a little bit of insulin, um, before training. I had never done that before either. Wow. So I, I think just overall, there was a higher anabolic load of drugs <laughs> just in general that I've never even touched uh, with combination of a ton of food. And then I'm super motivated to train, right? So training, I always trained hard, but there's probably a, I think a volume increase in training that I had made if I had to look back in the programming then. So just, just a lot of stimulus thrown at me. And I remember we were going, I'm like, Matt, I'm, I'm gaining like, five pounds this week he's like dude your glutes are still like striated like just eat he's like make your cheat meals bigger (laughs) so i eventually got to like 225 by the end of like i think it was uh, like eight to ten weeks phase um to where we like push the brakes we're like all right let's let's pull everything back and that was uh a, a lot of probably a lot of the progress that was made during that time period um now i know people want to say like i don't I don't teach that on J3U of like pushing this post show, like rebound phase once you might get one good one, but man, after that, it, they're never the same. Um, I, I, I found like after that, my, I got pretty soft and a lot of that fullness dropped off. Then I was also like, I ran this big cycle. Now I have to like have the health aspects to account for so I have this chunk of time to do all this. And then all the cycles we ran after that, there wasn't a ton of progress, but it was there. So I, w- what I promote now is take that phase to just a lesser extent to where you have like good health markers at the end of your post-show phase. And then you bring gear in and you just ramp it up. Because, man, post-show – it's crazy in that anabolism, right? Like get the right. most from the least and just keep escalating all off season long. So we don't take all the gains in like the first six weeks. We like spread them out. And uh, I think you can manage health variables better that way. Cause man, with Matt, like at that time we weren't checking a lot of health stuff, man. I, I, I look so bloated and around. I'm sure my blood pressure and heart were like <laughs> screaming. Right. But anyway, that's uh that, that was the gist of how that went down. Yeah, I mean that's pretty similar. I, I work with Justin Harris. That's pretty similar to what he does. He pushes 
the post show period, the rebound phase. I, you know, I'm I'm an old man, but I had a had a 50 pound, almost a 50 pound weight jump from my uh, 2021 to 2022 yeah. uh, stage weight. It was it was it was crazy, man. Um, but it was the same deal, you know. Cut the gear in half, drop the orals, push the food really hard post show. And, you know, and like people, it's funny because people say you can't make progress at, at my age. And it was, it was, it was pretty nuts, man. This was, you know, not, not to brag on myself, but this was, this was the jump from, I was 187 and I went up to 233. No, that's, one, that's, that's silly progress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at 48 years old. So like, but yeah, you're right. I, I think the, I think that like, like you mentioned, I think the, um, the key to that is sucking down really hard. Like a lot of people never truly suck down really hard, like get super crazy lean. And then like, like you were saying, you, you have this just period of sensitivity where you, you're just super, uh, little, super yeah. respond. You, you just soak up everything. But that, that was like the majority of those games came, came in that eight week post show rebound phase. But you, you'll see it like with guys that um, take that leap forward. They all have that year. Everybody has that year. It's it seems like where they go from just looking like a regular you know, local bodybuilder to looking like a pro. Yeah, and like I said, I've tried to do it again, and it's just it doesn't. No, it doesn't work the second time. It's, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, you, you you get you get one of those, and so and and it, you know I think you have to keep in context, right? Like the the timeline for someone competing, right. like if it's worth doing, and also what is your phase afterwards because. Like for our, our schedule at the Olympia, like, man, we get really short off season. So how much do you want to milk out of every phase? And if you have some guy that has like this really long extended off season, you have time to pull back and push back up and whatever. Man, it makes sense to do that. But at some point, the Olympia level, like, man, if you're, if you have like high gear, all, all, all contest, then some gear post contest, then you still need time to like grow again in off season. Like, man, you kind of have to, Pick the times where it's going to make the most yeah. sense to really to really try to push and grow. So, what do you do? Just pull back to TRT after your shows now, and and then just taper up into the into the show. Yeah. So, well, oh, like, but like for this certain yeah, this like, between, right now, like like so, for example, like right now. Yeah. So for this, uh, but after Atlanta, I mean, quote unquote TRT, right? What is that? Right. Uh, yeah. Right. That's yes. relative. So maintenance phase, whatever we want to call it. Yeah. Well, like, so for Atlanta, like some gears already like tapering down going into the show, there's a couple orals in place, but you know, week one post contest, a relatively a lot of gears already come down. So rather than that first week, like bring it back up. Um, I, I, in for the, I have like 10, you know, what was this? Uh, 11 weeks, I guess it was. Um, since it's already low, I was like, well, I'll already keep it lower give like health a break, maintain that condition level that I have. And then I basically push into like your kind of rebound phase, like you would from there. And then I escalate gear up to where now, like right when I fall back into that five to six week out mark, I'll have like my peak dosing because you got to consider like the esters accumulation, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm injecting this stuff, it's not really fully hitting. And and I want it to be fully hitting when I'm in my fat loss phase. So I wanted like I need some break. So I, I figure it's better to take it right after the show when gear's already coming down, and then I can bring it up. And then right, I'm just that makes look, sense. Then I'm just looking at my weeks out from Atlanta for for, for fat loss tracking. So I'm, I looked at today. I did my check in myself today. Um, I'm eight weeks out, and so I, I I looked back and I was like, all right, I have three week out condition compared to Atlanta. Ooh. So I have now like five more weeks where I could keep pushing food up with gears still escalating up as I'm, you know, running this stuff. And I'll, I'll, if there's growth that happens, hell yeah, absolutely. I'll take it. Um, and then I'll, I'll just do that week by week until I see I'm back to a point where I'm X weeks out, just like I was from Atlanta and need to pull back to have the fat loss occur. So today I was um, 224 in the morning and I compared back to like 217 when I was three weeks out. Okay. So up like seven, seven pounds from that look and like three week out condition. Now people like, Oh, John will be seven pounds heavier. Like, no man, like this is, it's on the tail. It's on different spectrums, right? One's kind of depleted. The other one's pretty damn full. So it's, it'll uh, 
maybe maybe average out on, on stage weight or something. <laughs> so I actually reviewed that data last night. Do you mind if we talk about the actual numbers or is that something for J3U specifically? Oh, man, I, I don't care. I mean, um, you know, with with numbers, I just – I guess it's all the issue, relative. It, it is. Yeah. It is. I guess people are going to look like, oh, that's what I should do. You well, know, I, yeah. I mean, if they were a <laughs> 220 pound Olympian, it's like, wow, not, just like, I, yeah. that's why I, I try to teach, like, let me teach you the questions to ask so you know the dosages you should be running. <laughs> so um, I guess where I was going with this was it seemed that you had ran your full master on load up until the week of the show. You'd cut your test load in half about four weeks out, you kept, you increased your master on load by about 20%. And then right before the show, you were running X and six X test and master on specifically. And then right after the show, you were down to just like super HRT test with a little bit of master on as well. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I'm thinking is you've got about what a four week tail off that master on before, so that before it bleeds out, that's going to put you at seven weeks out from you were going to do Legion before the Olympia, correct? Right. 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 Okay. And then at what point when you know it takes four weeks to ramp back up, do you pull the trigger and go right back up to that six X level of master on? Because it seems that there would be no period at which it would be low because yeah. it's tapering down. And then before it's even completely tapered down, you're going to have to pull the trigger and blast it back up again even if you're not going to reintroduce more test. Yeah, it is quite the predicament, is it? So it's, it's basically how much risk do you want to take? And, and how much do you want to try to give back to like on the health side of the equation? Okay. Because I totally understand like this gear is not out of my system for a few weeks post-show. Um, but you also need a certain amount of time for that to come back up to peak. Right. So it's just how much of that time do you want to come down? Because by no means like Todd, right. And my, Am I hitting back down to a stable level right. of even a, a base that would hold me, which usually like a base of, we're like maybe 400 milligram per week, 300 milligram per week on the low end of certain phases. So by no means am I ever reaching down to that. But again, we can pull out some of the toxic stuff, right? Like any orals I was running, um, right. let, let a little time off of, of trend before we bring those back in. So, you know, your question of like when to know, when to bring it back up, I mean, honestly, I could have probably waited till I knew for sure, maybe three weeks before fat loss really needed to happen and start start bringing that up. I probably could have waited out longer, but also I, I just weighed in the fact that I'm doing I'm doing an open show. So what am I comfortable with? Um, how hard do I want to push it versus um, be as conservative as possible? And I think for the, the level I compete at, I, I accepted that risk of, of going back in a little bit earlier because, because very well. So there are guys that probably just run it all high straight through. Right. Well, that's what I was thinking was <laughs> because you're yeah. so meticulous with your pictures and your weights and your numbers, you're not intuitive. Well, I shouldn't say you're not intuitive, but you are a scientist in your way of approaching this. I would think the added variable of a decreasing and increasing master on load and its effects on the kidneys retention of sodium would throw off a lot of your math. And it would seem the, the safest bet to leave it in because it's, you know, if it's 10 weeks more versus six weeks more, and then the other four weeks are really at 50% on average, it seems like just if you left it in, you'd be able to really control your numbers more efficiently. And the weight, the look would be more indicative of what was going on under the skin. Yeah. See, like going, so like going into that show, the gear in place, even, even weeks before, I already had a level that could give a pretty predictive look, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, had, I had brought tests down to a level where an AI wasn't needed to right. pull more water off, right? Because right? I've already tested this stuff out. Like 500 megs of test was what, what, you know, earlier on in prep, I could take an AI one night and I would drop two, three pounds the next day. Okay. I'm like, all right, this is driving some water retention for sure. That test got tapered down to a level that if I put an AI in for one night to test this out, there was no water drop from there. Um, Masteron, I, I don't see it driving aldosterone or water retention really at all. Okay. Um, like just 
even anecdotally, like, I mean, for the amount I'm running well over a gram of Mastron alone. So I'm not, I'm not seeing a water retention effect, anything close to like if you were doing tests from Angelone. So I don't see that blurring the visual. Now, even off this last show, like growth hormone, honestly, that was the biggest impactor that I saw because removing, I did stop tests like nine days out because I wanted to make sure anything was out of place that could cause me not to get down to 212, right? right. I knew that amount of test though, likely wasn't skewing my visuals. Now growth hormone, the, the like two days after I dropped that, I dropped like two and a half pounds. Well, you, <laughs> you cut from six to three, I believe, right? Or did you take it out entirely at the very end? That, it, it, it went from six and then eventually it went down to three. Three was in place for a lot of the prep. Then three got pulled okay. nine, nine days out. And okay. even at three, like there was some water amount there. So I, I, have, I have all these numbers like they're documented to where I know what pulling I can, you know, leverage for what. So I knew going off this past cycle into the show, that amount of test I was running wasn't problematic. The amount of Masteron and Trend I was running was an issue. Also the Anivar. Um, the growth hormone was was more, more of the probably the water retention issue. So even bringing testosterone back up, it actually went a little higher than what I ran previously. Mm -hmm. um, for one, I think if you're really, really lean, you're not going to have as much water retention issues as right. when you're like really, really fat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so I might, you know, gain a, a little bit more fullness around that, but to, yeah, to your question, um, I, I haven't seen skew the visuals, um, and even comparing condition wise, like there's, there's not much blurring there, but the growth hormone, there is some, I already know, like the, I'm running five I use now that that's going to have a little bit more water effect. However, I'm also leaner, so, and I don't have to make weight. So I'm going to have to judge how much fullness the drugs bring versus condition if there is loss to bring out like the best look, right? Because you don't just say like, oh man, pull it all out to get your water down, be as hard as possible because you might, you, you judge as a complete person, right? So you might lose so much fullness off all your front shots that it's not worth chasing the extra glute line, but um, I hope that roundabout way yeah. answered your question. I, oh, I don't, sure. I don't want to overcomplicate trying to time out when esters are dropping. And it's just, I don't, I don't um, see it's worth chasing down that nuance. Right. It's, it's funny that this question popped up right now. Cause the, my follow-up question was that um, there's this rumor that we can't debunk because we've looked that Mastron is a selective estrogen receptor modulator analog but Primo is an aromatase inhibitor analog, uh. <laughs> whereas I figured they both worked as aromatase inhibition. Have you seen anything about this debate? I mean, I've, I've heard, I've heard the debate. Okay. Um, and I have never come across like good hard evidence between application around either. Like if you look back in the breast cancer research around deployment, it's very vague on mechanistic action around how, how they actually are, working in interaction wise with like aromatase or blocking the androgen receptor. Right. I mean, I'm sorry, estrogen receptor, like a serm would. Um, Cause the, the actual idea around it was that on a breast cancer cell, right? You have estrogen receptors, you have androgen receptors. And basically the, the androgen receptor has like a, uh, an offsetting input to the input of the, right. the estrogen. So you're basically just um, partitioning more towards androgens which right. offsets the estrogen, but not necessarily blocks aromatase or even blocks the receptor site. So the the action of how they use them for like breast cancer, that's how it applies. Um, it's just the est androgen to estrogen ratios get skewed. Right. But you very well, same application. Like that's, I think that's where we blur, right? People are like, oh, it I works like an AI. Well, the, the, the outcome is, is a similar response you might notice, but I think oh, the mechanism on. is different. Yeah, like for the chart, I think in question, it showed that Masteron completely shrunk the breast tumor. But for that to be the case, that it's working like a serum, it would have to bind to the androgen receptor and the estrogen receptor, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, I think the easiest way to debunk this is I've done blood work sequentially with Primo, and I've seen as I increase Primo, my estrogen goes down with the same level of testosterone. To me, that proves it's an AI or it, it functions as an AI. It binds to the aromatase enzyme and inhibits its, its competitive inhibitor for the substrate testosterone. 
have you noticed on blood work as your Masteron crept up? For instance, this past prep, when you cut your test in half and increased your Masteron, did your estrogen decrease by a significant amount? So I... I have I didn't get labs at that time to be able to pull it out, but I'd say like across like clients seeing lab work, mm. a- absolutely like it. Okay. I've seen lower estradiol amounts when mastron's creeping up to where they're able to tolerate more testosterone. Right, um, and, and that definitely is the case. So there, it, it's it's happening. Um, it's some people are just going to like try to drill you. Like you can't prove that and it doesn't work. It's like well, right. we see it in lab work and people are tolerating more testosterone. So whatever the mechanism there, like it's, uh, it is doing it, but it would make a lot of sense, Todd, like that if you have a higher androgen, they're all trying. And I think Dr. Dean St. Martin, he, he really presents as well with uh, how molecules bind to the enzymes and that you're still your master. And we'd be trying to, to bind to, to aromatase and being some competitiveness with the testosterone molecule. So in turn, you might see that lower amount of, of estrogen being present there also is a study with provirone uh, mm-hmm. just using pure DHT. And once you type, if you, I forget the actual, I have to like, that's been a while back, but once you bring the provirone up enough, there is some actual um, action like it is an aromatase inhibitor. So basically if you drive it up high enough, there is action there. So there, there's so there's some like study around. I could send it to you if you like, but again, it's, it's not, it's not using Primo and Masteron. It's using uh, provirone. So what I was familiar, and I'd love to see the study. I remember that provirin was used to mop up SHBG. So in your lectures, you talk about how boron lowers SHBG levels. I believe that provirin functions as a competitive inhibitor of SHBG. And then also Masteron used to have the reputation of being competitive inhibitor for SHBG. But for instance, like Primo isn't attributed that special property. And the, the guy's question that isn't on the screen anymore is what do you see as the differences between Primo and Masteron? Mm. And to me, the biggest difference was the welt. The like, gentleman who they, asked the question, you, I actually wanted to clarify. Oh, he wanted uh, he, more he, he performance. Didn't mean, yeah, I want to know more about performance look results between Masteron. Because I remember, John, you used to, um, I think in one of your most recent off seasons, you use you split the difference between Primo and Masteron. I think when I asked you about it, I think your answer was it was either availability or cost, that yeah. Primo was either hard to get or hard to get reliable Primo. So you filled in the gap with Masteron, indicating a preference for Primo. Is that still the case? Yeah, so, you know, around that... Primo's so tough, man, to, to, to trust. Like we've sent some off for testing and it's been, comes back as like EQ. Um, oh, wow. wow. You know, and, and, and you, you might not know the difference. Like once, once the androgen load is so high, like if you're growing, you, you know, it's like, yeah, I guess this is all working. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> all right. Um, so I, I actually preferentially will use a lot of Masteron this past off season. I, my main driver was yeah. like Mas- Masteron. Um, I noticed that you had no Primo in this off se- in this um, pre-contest phase. Yeah, and partly because for one, a- for access a reliable product, I just don't trust it. So I wanted less variables, made a lot of sense. So if I had test, mass, and Primo all in and you came up with an issue, you'd say, well, is this, is my mass, is it test, or is my Primo, is it EQ? It just made more more guesswork from a coaching perspective. Um, then also injection volumes. That is the biggest thing. Um, you know, try to inject like four mils of Primo uh, and your test and all, you know, everything else. Yeah. So at, with mass, you could get mass D 200 mg per mil. It, it goes smooth as butter. So I'll just, I'll just use mass and it's less likely fake than comparatively to Primo. Um, Brilliant. Yep. Yeah, real I primo. primo. I used to get huge welts, whereas mass I get nothing. Oh, real Primo has a horrible PIP. <laughs> Yo, two hundred mg per mil is like, it's 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 unrealistic to even use. <laughs> yeah, for Primo, I can attest to that. My triceps were nineteen and a half. I had nineteen and a half inch <laughs> arms, but they looked horrible. But I had huge arms. I got to see what I would look like with big arms. The, the Todd protocol to to big arms. Yeah, it's, <laughs> who needs synthol when you could just use real Primo and have a huge infection or and inflammation? I know we get like 
you know, labels to these drugs like Masterons for hardening and it doesn't build muscle or, you know, Primo's a really lean builder. Or, um, but, if, you know, we look back at some of the like Hirschberger essays and on, on a milligram basis, I, I truly still believe that for the most part, the drugs build tissue at about the same same rate and what they really differentiate is still side effects with with a little bit of exception of durant testosterone because you get estradiol along with it and estradiol has its yeah. own like anabolic actions but you know around what to pair with testosterone my first thing would be like what do you know is going to be 100 percent real and then also like you know rotate between them and see what you get along best with side effect wise after that that that's just the total milligram amount I've heard, I've heard it multiple times. I've heard Justin Harris say it. I've heard Jordan Peters say he, he just, just shoot three mils or whatever, you know, um, and, and it goes like, shoot three mils of whatever, and then do insane stiff legged deadlifts in your flip flops. Yeah. And then you hear something because he always does hear something. Justin was that, just saying he, he would mix like all his gear in one big vial and just inject it. All <laughs> that's me. That's why. Yeah, I, I, I was like, yeah, I even put chase. my GH in there, and I know people say you can't mix the GH with the test. I'm like, why? And they're like, you water and oil don't mix. I'm like, shake it. It's mixed. It's a yeah, punch uh, now, gentlemen. So here, so oh, we I'm have sorry. like we have evidence showing like you know a, across the board, like for the most part, all these drugs they build muscle about the same. We have anecdotal from like big bodybuilding coaches that hey, you take enough milligrams, like that's what matters most. What you fill those milligrams in with is just how you want to manage side effects the best. So uh, you know, I think you could grow off Masteron, you grow off Primo, you, you, you of course grow off EQ or whatever. But I, I mean, I mean, my drug selection is based off what I know is real and what's is going to be the most benign side effect wise. You had mentioned EQ, and I know that in the lecture series, it talks about how EQ is more renal toxic than the other drugs. I haven't found anything. I think you had a study, and I read that. But, I mean, can you break it down for our viewers why you think EQ is more renal toxic? Yeah. So, the again, like with this steroid research, it's very primitive stuff. I mean, it's we're talking these drugs come back in like the sixties. Right. So even the studies back then, a lot of them are animal models. So some people just completely throw them out. Like, Oh, that, that won't matter. We have, we have one human study and they have the group of bodybuilders divided into two and they're all self-administering these drugs. Right. So uh, one group, the only difference in is they're using um, EQ or the other group they're using uh, Dianabol milligram Mm -hmm. totals are the amount the one that incurred the most renal issues was the group with the only difference was equipoise. Now you could tear the shit out of that study and you could completely throw it out. Just like all the other studies, there's like a rat model study, uh, a, a rabbit model study too, that looks at greater renal issues using equipoise. Um, there was one other, I think it's a rodent study too, that, that comes to mind um, with some comparative data around that. So, I mean, it, it's it's not awesome evidence, right? It's very low tier. Um, there's other rationales around it, too. Just from an application standpoint of, for one, this EQ has never gone through the same clinical testing that we have used all a lot of the other steroids for, just like you'd want every drug to go through. You'd say, well, this was back in the 60s and 70s, so how well was the testing back then? And, mm. yeah, t- tear, tear it apart, you know, sure. Um, and, and very well, like, with... All the drugs, if you're going to take a lot of drugs, they're all going to mess up like heart, kidneys, and incur some amount of stress. So is EQ what, – what, that's the question. How much more toxic is it to the kidneys versus right. Primo or Mass? And I, I can't say, but at least we do have some strain of evidence right. that shows that there's a good possibility. So if there's a little bit of possibility that it might – but we have other options on the table that likely right. drive growth just the same, without but, the with, but without the side effects. And, and we like primabolin. We have studies looking at in females up to twelve hundred milligram per week in females, and it's with, fine. with with like a some virilization, but but not that not that bad. Which uh, in a man isn't a problem. So I guess yeah. the question then is like, there's two other rumors about primo. I mean, not primo. Um, EQ is that it causes anxiety. And then it also causes increased appetite, and that's why they give it to horses. And I figure the mechanism that it's supposed to cause the kidney problems is that because it's supposed to increase erythropoietin, it's supposed to increase your red, red, red blood cells. So I guess if your blood's thicker, that means it'd be less blood to the kidney, and that's how it's nephrotoxic. I mean, 
but that's all supposition. Yeah, I, I couldn't say because like I see a lot of guys, it's testosterone usually driving up more red blood cell problem than because you have DHT and DHT seems to drive up right. red blood cells even more than, than EQ. So right. I, I don't know. If, I don't think that's necessarily the issue. Um, you also, it's very anecdotal when we see these things arise and when they're getting deployed, uh, like phase dependent, right? To where like, are people noticing things more than, because uh, all steroids in general raise appetite to a degree until you're like smashing orals and you have no appetite. Yeah. Um, like you had introduced some nangelone and like appetite could increase. But I think if you, if you plant a seed in someone's mind, they could believe it. Right. It's a nocebo effect where they get this, you know, like you, if you ever, I ran a lot of nandrolone only cycles with clients. I think Paul was one of my um, people who did that and, and I did it. And I found that with the people that knew nothing, they were fine. And then as soon as they heard the term decadic, all of a sudden they've got a red color. <laughs> <fun. laughs> it, it totally worked great. And then they started thinking about it and then they were in their head about it. And so now it stops working. And I feel like that's pretty much how most of these forums work is that it's all all these mysteries and um, rumors are perpetuated because of the nocebo and placebo effects associated it, with them. It, it's wild looking back. None of the guys in the 80s and 70s ran testosterone. Not, none of those guys did. So you you mentioned the orals on prep. There was one other question about prep. In the past, you had ran a Pepsi challenge between Halo, Anavar, <laughs> and Superdrawl, and you said it didn't make a fucking difference. They're all the same. I don't even know if you quantified the um, the actual <laughs> milligram amounts, but you were like, the Superdrawl should work better because it retains water inside the muscle and not outside the cell, and you ran it. I think you even used injectable Superdrawl, and it didn't really do a whole lot for you, you said, compared to the Anavar. And since Anavar is safer, let's just use Anavar going forward. And then this prep, it seems like you peaked with Anadrol. I know you ran Anavar at the end pre-workout for, to drive performance. And then the other question I'm going to follow up with is, did you use sublingual administration? But first, I guess the first question is... Anal. Anal administration. <laughs> well, then that makes a lot of sense. That gets around the liver just fine. Bukakle. <laughs> no one's so, taking my out. protocol. <laughs> Stop giving out my secrets, Todd. Yeah, it's uh, anal, anal administration with a turkey. Why is it always no a suppository? <laughs> so I can't tell if you're kidding, but I would actually do that if it worked better. I don't give a shit. All right. So, um, so the anadrol. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so to go back to like what I'd say, like if we say at a, on a milligram level, working on the antigen receptor, all these drugs build muscle about the same. If we can lay that out, how you deploy oil or orals would make a lot of sense because we shouldn't put labels on the drugs like, well, halitestin makes you really hard and then Anavar is for like strength and Anadrol is for fullness because then you start using all of them and you don't have a good rationale be trying the drug deployment at the end of prep. Because I've, I've done preps for 212 and I use five different orals. I use fucking all of them at the same time. And was I all of a sudden <coughs> the hardest guy around? No. What? No, I wasn't. <laughs> I, I've actually been in greater shape using one oral. So these drugs, how do you get hard off oral? That's what you want to say. Like, and that's not a pun, Todd. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, you'd say like, well, OK, um, it ha does it make you cause fat loss occur like any one of these orals? It's like they have some mechanism a little bit, but that's not the drug I would use to lose body fat. Right. It'd probably be clenbuterol or something. Maybe it has to do around managing water. Like that's the only other way someone's going to look visually harder. Or maybe fullness, right? Pushing some muscle against the skin. So has it going to be offsetting estrogen? Maybe. But likely we already have plenty of fucking androgen around to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the other way that could cause water is like managing cortisol and fatigue. A steroid's the best play when you have like a lot of fatigue. You're like, hey, coach, man, my legs are so tired from cardio. He's like, oh, yeah, man, let's add in 100 mg of uh, Anivar. No, he's probably like, yeah, it takes, let's taper down some cardio today or whatever. So, so I, I think... Let me round this out. When you're using an oral and prep, your decision should be based around maintaining tissue, which is what their job is to do. Right. So how do you know you're losing tissue on prep? The best proxy is gym performance. Yeah. yeah. So when you see performance dropping on the tail end of prep, 
that's when the oral should go in because right. it's fast acting and you're not waiting for these injectables to climb up in dosage. So which oral to play? That one is one you should switch around and see which one you really get along best with. And that maybe presents the less side effect for you. What I did with my test, Todd, you mentioned in 2021 is I just used one for each show because I competed all year. I did like all the shows. Right. Um, I did Anabar. Um, I did Halo. I tried Super Draw. Super Draw was only the last few days right. so for, for fullness. But the other ones I ran for a little bit longer duration. Uh, just for me personally, Anabar had the actual outcome of like really boosting gym performance to an extent. Why it seemed more than that than others um, there might be some mechanisms around it that yet you can discuss. I just, I don't like to get tied up because I think people make some of these drugs is way too complicated. It's really not that exciting. I, you know, in my mind. Um, but yeah, so I, I would, I would put in the one that's probably the most benign that's going to drive gym performance up and you would run that into, into the show. Now, as far as like peaking for a show, there are some orals and if, Hey, if it's for the aesthetic point and you're like, man, I think, I really think halo is going to make me hard. It's like, we'll just put it in the last like five days, you know, last right. week. You know, I could handle a week of like a bunch of orals in not eight weeks, which we see. Right. So um, back, back to what you were saying though, about the, the anadrol, a few of these drugs could drive some extra fullness and the super draw was just a fail. Um, it didn't drive it that to an extent that I saw and also, I pulled my labs post show, and my liver enzymes were a mess. And that's when I already a few days <laughs> off of it. So, Anadrol, I think if you're skinned out, you're not going to have a lot of water retention that's even going to occur around, just in general. Like a lot of the drugs that drive water retention. Um, and with Anadrol, likely there is maybe a mechanism of it binding around the estrogen receptor. And with the estrogen, it also has a mechanism around increasing glucose and glycogen storage through probably more GLUT4 um, uptake. Uh, it could it could very well just be that it jumps up your aldosterone a little bit and you retain a bit more water, but you're so lean it doesn't matter. Uh, so this last show after weigh-ins, that's the protocol I use. I used basically 50 milligrams of Anadrol um, twice a day. 50 milligrams. Lean. Point zero zero zero. <laughs> so is, that, get, is that uh, you, Colton? Siri, shut up. <laughs> so Siri wants to put in her uh, her two bits about anadrol. So I, I I did I looked this up too. Is um I think the enzyme is eleven hydroxybutyrate. I believe that prevents the water from clearing, and that's how anadrol is supposed to cause water retention better than others, mm -hmm. and that although. Anadrol doesn't bind to SHBG. A metabolite of androgel binds to SHBG, and that bumps theoretical estrogen off of the SHBG that was pre-bound, and that that estrogen, assuming you have an estrogen level, is what would then bind to the estrogen receptors. Did you find anything that says that the anadrol itself binds to the estrogen receptor? I haven't. I haven't. Okay. So I, I just I know we have like the anecdotal around you know people running anadrol and, and getting gyno. Getting gyno, right? Right, and the, so the, the theory is it's from Maybe. the metabolite binding to the SHBG and then bumping off free estrogen because who runs a cycle without testosterone? Pretty much everyone does. So there's always going to be some estrogen present. But I knew in your situation you had zero estrogen because you had zero test at that point. And I thought at that point his anadrol should function the way superdrol is supposed to function because there's no potential estrogen involved then. Well, I mean, there, there might've still been some tests because I only cut tests nine days out. So there might, yeah. it, it could be trailing down some um, hard to say, but I, I would say it's by far no means the game changer. Um, I think it didn't drive probably extra fullness if I had it in place or not. Maybe I would have needed some more time with it. I think what was the game changer was that I had 36 hours to eat before I had to go on stage and I was able to put in like, I think I had like 1200 grams of carbs across that whole day. That was number one over Anadrol. So anyone that's like, man, I need to peak with Anadrol. This is the secret. It's like, <laughs> no, man, you just need enough carbs, sodium and water. That's, that's what's going to be the game changer. So yes. So that's why man, like these drugs, like people want to get down the rabbit hole with them of, of like, they make this huge impact. And I haven't found one in like a peak week scenario where it would like automatically, took me from like 
uh, you know, 80% to 100%. It's, it's always come down to like being really lean and having the right amount of carbs, sodium, water to be like that balance of full and hard. Man, the drugs just make such a little impact at that point. Did you happen to use any Humalog or Lantus to help load those carbs? Or Because I know you're not really a big fan of insulin in pre-contest, but I didn't know if that applied to peaking. No, I, I, I didn't. Um, cool. You're so insulin sensitive at that point. Like it, it, I don't even think it matters. That's how I feel about it, man. You, you could, for the amount, you could put so many carbs in. I, I just don't even think you need insulin. I used them actually, insulin the first time with Jansen in 2015. You brought that up, Paul, to, to peak for that show. And man, we took like three IUs. That was the first time I ever took it. I was freaking out because I was so nervous. We had like Rice crispy treats, like, but, but you know, beside just like, like all of a sudden I'm going to go into a, you know, pass out. <laughs> and we, we had like 80 grams of carbs and then like, uh, 45 minutes later, I started feeling a little shaky. And I was like, oh, yeah, I have like some extra food. And therein lies the problem is you start putting a little insulin in and now you're having to feed the insulin yeah. and push more food potentially than you wanted to. So I agree with you, Paul. I think you're so sensitive that it just doesn't even make sense at that point. Um, it's just not yeah, it complicates the, the, the process. Last year, Justin had me uh, carving up. I work with Justin Harris, but he had me carving up on, um, it was 200 grams of carbs per meal. I ran three units of insulin and went hypo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's how sensitive I was at the end. It was, cra it was crazy. Yeah. So that John, brings up another question. Oh, uh, Colton, you had a question? Yeah. What, because this is something you see kind of a lot of within the, especially, you know, older school coaches. I had Blue Taylor as a coach. I love him. But this is one thing he's very adamant on is like super dosing Proviron, like extremely high doses of Proviron throughout eight weeks out, you know, even sometimes 10, 12 weeks out. You see this so often with older school coaches. And I know there's, I've heard you speak on it before, and I, I just kind of want to reiterate that and, and kind of hear what your thoughts are. Yeah. Um, I mean, with, with Proviron, I mean, the, the, the thing with DHT is, like, they get thrown into the bit, the bucket, right, of, like, Masteron Primo, their DHT, Proviron's DHT. Uh, the reason Masteron and Primo and, like, Anavar, they actually have anabolic properties is that they change the structure. And, Todd, you probably nerd away on this stuff to where the, the enzyme that's in skeletal muscle – I think it is like 11 hydroxy steroid yeah. dehydrogenase. Yeah. Uh, wow, I remembered that. <laughs> that's that's the enzyme that will break down T DHT in the skeletal muscle and render it to a very very weak androgen. So on skeletal muscle, it's not very anabolic at all. Like guys aren't taking Proviron and just like exploding with size, right? right. Now, but you grow with Anavar, Masteron, Primo, all these other DHT derivatives, and, and that's how they they differentiate off that issue, off that mechanism of how they've been structured. So then you bring up like, well, why take Provirone? And honestly, I don't have much application around Provirone. Now you could, and how someone says, well, it's a hardener. Right? And again, we go back to what we already talked about. How does it make you hard? And you could skew that androgen to estrogen ratio. Maybe that has some impact, but personally, I really take something that's anabolic as well. That could also skew the ratio. So rather than taking whatever, 700 megs of Proviron per week, 100 megs per day. Why don't we take 700 megs of Primo or Masteron? It's going to do the exact same thing. And you might say, well, it's going to lower SHBG. Like, man, once you move above TRT levels, SHBG yeah. is crashed for almost everybody. Yeah. So it's not even a thing. Like, don't even take it for that. Where I see application for Proviron are, are for guys that are running, like, close to TRT amounts that maybe have a little bit of estrogen issues. And so their test levels have to be pretty low. And they have like some libido problems. So we could have some like Proviron in place to drive like the libido aspect and the psychological benefit around that. But man, once you move into bodybuilding territory, I don't even, I don't even mess with it. And another issue, it's so fucking expensive and also yeah. super hard to access. So it's just like a, a bunch of red flags of Proviron for, for like ben benefits for cost. Mm. And, yeah. but Hey, uh, if there's a, I'm sure there's an application around how maybe maybe Blues use it. He has, his guys, you know, a lot of guys grow, a lot of guys get in good shape. So, um, but at least yeah. that's that's my thoughts on the application. 
The logic I'd always heard is that it's another DHT you can throw at it oral that with without liver toxicity. That was just sort of what I've well, heard. Sort of I don't think it's 17 methylated, but then it wouldn't survive first pass anyway. Yeah. What was that, yeah, Colton? I've I've just never seen the difference with myself. You know, through preps, trying it and then not trying it with blue, and it's like. The, the difference is virtually not there and I don't feel any different. It's just like, I'm saving a couple hundred bucks a month and it's like, you know, why would I do spend that if it's reasonably not providing any kind of benefit? I would rather have more GH money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I actually have a, a, a handful of questions about GH, but I don't want to do dominate if someone else has other questions before I get started. Have, have y'all have y'all run GH like super high in prep? That was what we were going to talk to you about <laughs> compared, compared to experiment. off season. Because uh, I really run GH really high off season in prep, but for certain reasons, right? Okay, so Chase just did this experiment where he used 18 units because the Serostim container says use 18 units for 100 for 50 kilogram person. 18, right? Before yeah. bed, not split up. So me and Roman talked about this part, and he's like, the reason why they tell you not to split it up is because compliance. A patient isn't yeah. going to be sophisticated enough to split their doses. So they just have you shoot it all at once. And if you look at the chart, by the time that bleeds out at a four-hour half-life, you're pretty much only missing the late afternoon anyway. So that brought I, I rewatched your GH lecture, I think four times. And then I read some of the, the correlated articles and we, you and me went back and forth on a J3U in June about the um, localized study, the frost study from 2005. And that it seems that despite the fact that Chase put on 50 pounds and he, he said, this was a game changer. I also talked to Andrew Barry about this. And he got that tip from John Meadows is to shoot the whole serostim thing at night. And then I also talked to um, Martin's old coach, which is um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. And we all discussed it. And it's like, even though the two IU at a time spaced out is what's supposed to work best because it drives up local IGF one, not systemic IGF one and systemic IGF one is inhibitory towards localized IGF one. It seems everyone burns more fat and builds more muscle when they shoot a shit ton before bed. And then it's always a shit ton. It's not like the same amount before bed is better than spread out. It's a shit ton before bed is better than spread out. Here's and so a, my method and what I've been doing is two Chase. units in the morning before fasted cardio two units post training and then i'll use another eight units before bed and Here. i've been seeing really fast fat loss and i've seen an increase in size in about three weeks so far this, this was this was chase before and after his 18 units experiment <laughs> <laughs> so was this like a re a post show rebound kind of phase or? no no <laughs> this was cutting okay yeah, I mean, he he basically came off TRT. He was trying to have a kid. But um, keep, keep in mind too the the difference is he's also running six grams of testosterone. He wasn't at the time. He wasn't Not at the that time. much. He what? was running at two grams. <laughs> <laughs> he was running two grams, and then after uh, he got up to two seventy, he went up to four grams. Then after he got up to two eighty, he went up to six grams. He was just experimenting i think to see how his blood work where i would never run that high but so so we don't know it was just a ton of gear huh <laughs> yeah a ton of gear yeah i guess if you throw in, throw the kitchen sink at it something's gonna so, stick right so i guess yeah, you hope so like if you don't like damn damn yeah right? sad, sad <laughs> so, story that was by basically that the what prompted me because i've been down this rabbit hole i even bought kikel's book and read read kikel's book and kikel's like shoot it at night or take a third of it, break it off, and do it post-training. And that seems to be like, and we talked about it. I mean, what are your thoughts about this? Because how, because the idea that it's two IU per 100 kilograms at one given time, it maximizes localized IGF-1 expression. Can that be amplified with increased estrogen? Can that be amplified with increased Insulin, like if we shot GH, insulin, GH, insulin, insulin, GH, and uh, like spread it out like that, where we resensitized and shot more frequently than four hours, how can we squeeze more GH into someone without breaking that localized IGF-1 rule? So this is my, my thought around growth hormone. 
And 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 so for growth hormone, at least the rise in it, you have a you have a like a peak serum level like around three hours. So the actual time for it to decline is a lot longer than just even that four-hour period. Right. So I think once once we get in that territory of growth hormone rise, timing is going to start to be less and less important. Like it, it can matter, but it's also probably only matters for around the fat loss aspect because growth hormone actual action on adipose tissue. And then once you have IGF-1 conversion, man, that's going to be elevated for like 36 hours after administration. So now at that point – it's really hard to control it. I, I think maybe if you're having like a one injection, right, but you, you might max out that effect or it might not even matter for localized. I have no way to say like systemic versus localized like that. That was like a cell culture study. So right. you're talking like bottom tier of evidence. So I think a growth hormone like calories for the day. Okay. Your total calories is what matters most for the day, whether you're going to lose weight or gain weight, right? Take your total growth hormone for the day. That's what matters most. Now, after your calorie amount, it probably matters like your macro breakdown. And then probably the very least important at the top is should I eat my protein 30 minutes before I train or like an hour before I train? <laughs> it's like, well, if you eat the right amount of protein for the whole day, it probably doesn't matter. And I think that's how uh, growth hormone definitely applies because we have plenty of guys using it all kinds of different ways. But it seems the more you take, you have – more X amount of response until you have a, a very more amount of side effect too that goes along with it. So I think the total dose is what matters most. Take your growth hormone for the day. If you want to get a little bit more nuanced, it's probably a good idea to break it up at least to two, maybe three times. Um, I think that's getting more into side effect control, maybe keeping more stable blood glucose. But again, if you want to get down to like, how can we like time it around this meal? With that long of an action time, it, it is you just won't even be able to do it. I don't I don't think it's worth chasing it down. So oh. I think like for this guy, this example here, like taking 30, 30 IUs at nighttime, like well, what if you took fifteen IUs AM and PM? Because we're comparing it a lot to like, well, no, I'm taking two IUs, AM, midday, and PM, but you're not taking like fifteen and fifteen. So I think you need some type of fair comparison like that. If so that, I guess yeah, that's where I kind of stand on growth hormone. I'm like, hey, don't overcomplicate it. Just take the amount of growth hormone needed to see out your effect with minimizing side effect, and probably splitting it into two uh, two doses per day would would probably make a lot of sense around blood wonder, glucose management. What you were doing was you were doing it twice a day because you said you would forget to bring it with you to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I was like, well, if that, I was like, I, I, that would drive me nuts for years. If I was like missing my, I would have my GH in the car. I'd have my insulin taped to my leg. So I would go in the bathroom, rip the insulin off, shoot it mid set. Or like, like I do my lifting, my heavy lifting first. Then I would shoot my <laughs> insulin and IGF one mid workout before I do my hypertrophy work. Then I would shoot my GH in the car because of the 15 minutes it takes to get home. <laughs> I wanted to maximize the amount of the peaks before my first meal. It's like, I never, it was like, oh, I just forgot to break it. I'm on my way to the Olympia. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, I've been taking this shit way too seriously for so long. I even did it to the point where I was, you know how like the mTOR pathway, supposedly you hit <laughs> two grams of leucine, it spikes mTOR, yeah. and then it takes four hours to reset but you can shoot carbs in the middle. And I say shoot carbs intentionally, shoot carbs in the middle and then it resends the mTOR. I was like, oh, that's like a brainchild. You do your GH and protein at 12, then you do your carbs and insulin at two. Then you can do your GH and protein at four. Then you could do your carbs and insulin at six. And I was like trying to mix and match. So there's eight <laughs> meals a day, one protein, one carb meal. And you shoot a different peptide with each of the meals. And I was like, I don't know anyone else doing this, and I'm not I'm growing. too lazy for all that shit. <laughs> yeah, I think like that over pontification is what kills a lot of people's progress in the first place. And and maybe yeah. there's data behind this stuff, but like the impact that it might actually have at a cellular level is so insignificant. It's like I would rather just shoot it all at once or something like that. You know, it's it's funny. It cool. reminds me of of uh, people doing the same thing, like over analyzing their their movements in the gym, or you know, like going out and buying the $200 squat shoes before they've, you know, managed to master, you know, squatting 225, you know, it's just well, like I, the... I wouldn't be, I wasn't there. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to be, different... be concerned if you kept pointing to yourself. <laughs> I've got multiple types of squat shoes because they all hurt my feet because they're all too narrow. 
That's why I just I, I opted for the ultimate squat shoe right out of the gate. I got Birkenstocks. <laughs> <laughs> I do Crocs. That's the way to go. Birken squats. Oh, Chase, Chase messaged me. He said I used the wrong before and after. This this is the right one. Yeah, that makes oh, more okay. sense. Okay. Yeah. But that's still, still 30 pounds. So crazy. <laughs> yeah. Was... And I, I that's not all water. That You can see that that's got some muscle to it. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Almost no yeah. fat. And someone was asking me about the waste. I'm like, he's eating more food. He's eating 6,000 calories. I don't think that that's uh, intestinal inflammation and stuff. And that brings up the other point is localized IGF-1 – you know, you do delt and delt that's going to be in the delt, but it still eventually goes systemically, most likely. Whereas if you inject, let's say, the subcutaneous fat, that's going to be systemic. But the systemic will go to your delts if you start lifting with your delts because of blood flow, correct? Yeah, I mean, some some might have some like liver conversion, then you might have some muscle conversion as well. So it's systemic. So yeah, it's likely getting shuttled around, right, to where you are training. But again, I think Todd, it's just, oh, I think it's overcomplicated more than what it probably needs to be. Especially when we see these yeah. like genetic freaks that for what they do, they're just, they don't even, they, it's just, yeah. just taking, taking up the drug and they're just freaks. Right. So I don't it's like, think man, Ronnie Coleman was thinking about all this shit. No, no. It's, uh, <laughs> right. so, Coleman, no rope. so if we were to break this down for the viewers so that they had a vague idea of what we concluded, what I'm hearing is, Shoot the lion's share before bed if you're trying to grow. If you're going to do fasted cardio, do maybe an, a unit and a half or two units before that. And post-training, you can use some of that GH2, assuming there's four hours in between post-training and bedtime. Does that sound about right? Those are the three best times to take it? Yeah, r- roughly. I mean, with growth hormone, I mean, if you're – if you're able to fast for like 90 minutes or so, 60 minutes before you do cardio, then probably two to three IUs there would actually have the, the most timing benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, pre-bed, there might be some application as we actually have a big rise at bedtime. And there is there is a study in children, AM versus PM, and they had better blood glucose control taking it at PM. So that might be another re- rationale where we would put it. Um, around training, probably doesn't matter too so much timing wise. Because we're looking for IGF one, and that's going to be take oh, a while yeah. to rise, and you're looking for hours. So I'd say, hey, if you want to do AM PM, divide it out that way. Or if you want to do AM and around training, uh, at that point, I think is just split your dose, and probably don't let that dose go over four IU's in one hit. Because um, we see plenty of pros. Anecdotally, we should look at what's done as well, and th- there's a ton of pros that probably will max out one dose around three to four IU's, and coaches that use it that way. So I think that gets you to a level of somewhere between probably six to 10 IUs is a good working range, max working range, because there's definitely benefit below. Right. But I, once, once I, when I see like beyond that, a lot of guys just have too many sides with water retention, hand numbness, blood pressure problems going beyond that amount. So yeah, that's uh, kind of my, my general takeaway on using growth hormone. And don't, don't think, don't make it any more complicated after that. All like, right, don't, like, yeah, don't, like, don't try to nuance the timing more. Like, that's going to be your big ticket to like, get the most out of your growth hormone. When did you start seeing side effects, Paul, at 12 units? Uh, once I got past 10, it was just like, my, I, I couldn't feel I'm my hands. 12 and right I, now, to... I have no side effects, but I used to get them at six. Back about 10 years ago, I'd get side effects at six units. Right now, I'm doing 12, no problem. And I know um, Chase says he was having no problems at 18 units when he was going sub Q. When he switched intramuscular, he started having problems. Paul, did you prep with high growth hormone with, with Justin? No, last year I didn't use hardly any. I think I was running like five units on one prep. That this was off season. You, you push it higher, I guess. Yeah, my thing on prep. I is tried like 15. Starts... I tried 15 for a while, but the, like when I when I did 15, I was falling asleep at my desk all day. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't stay get, awake. There's such a fatigue cost to it. You know? Yeah, that's so something. Like, like I struggled with too, is just the sleepiness and like trying to be productive was just a reasonable. It was so it wreaked havoc on my productivity. Garfield Most bodybuilders just lay on the couch, play video games. That's me. I just watched <laughs> attack on Titan and it's just <laughs> for like the last three days. It's all I did to go to the gym. I, I gotta be productive. I got businesses to run. Yeah. 
Maybe I'll bump my growth from it up these last weeks of pushing up before I drop and we'll see. What <laughs> you can even uh, blame it on me when you. <laughs> I don't. I never make two twelve again. <laughs> you can blame Todd. You're like, I was so sleepy. I slept through the show. Todd's son of a bitch. It was like, <laughs> well, for some guys, it like doesn't like they don't get watery off of it. Like it doesn't. It, it won't skew the visuals to where they can judge. Like, is this fat or is this water? I think that's the problem. I don't seem to get the water retention, but I never, I never carry a lot of water. Like even, even in the off season, I don't get the bloated. But my body's just always pretty dry. But I guess it's just how my body is. Everybody's different, though. You just lean and jacked, no fat. <laughs> no, I definitely get fat in the off season. But <laughs> man, I've had a million people ask me about diet. Uh, your approach to diet. I, I, do do you carb cycle or how, what do you what are you doing for for diet on on prep? Oh, uh, yeah. So funny thing. I was just on a podcast talking about this. Um, my first like coach, I wasn't bodybuilding was Shelby Starnes. And I had Justin Harris's like his book that he first came out with. And I yeah. was, man, I was full in on carb cycling. Um, I got away from it. Just I, I ended up going with more of a moderate with a little bit higher carbs and training days, but probably pretty correlated to how much I expend during a training session. And then on off days, carbs come down, but, you know, protein fats are all about the same. So it's nothing, nothing too exciting. So there's a a little bit rotation, but it's more based around uh, matching it with, with hunger and sati. And then if I need for food to go higher, I'll just, I'll start programming more carbs around training. Um, But yeah, I don't, I don't like rotate through the real extremes of high, very high carb days into very low days anymore. I've done in the past. I just um, both can work well. It might be one of those things that kind of averages out to relatively the same outcome if you're doing all the other things yeah. right. I wonder if it's not the net energy balance for the whole week that matters more anyway. So I don't know. I mean, it, you you yeah. know Justin's whole theory. It's it's oh the, yeah yeah it's grabbing uh, the super compensation and 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 you know glycogen storage and all that all that jazz kind of sort of cheating the ther- system of thermodynamics by pushing glycogen storage on those high days yeah no I, I i totally i totally get it i think you need to weigh into like when someone trains like um and also factor in your your rest day is also meant for recovery and that's when i when i went to a jansen we got that big rebound right I was like, why don't we run lower food on like our, our off days? It was like, man, it's, it's, you're still, that training bout is still carrying into your next rest day around recovery and glycogen uptake, protein synthesis. So you still want enough food there to support recovery. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it all, to have these bouts that cross over with that long of a time duration, it might all even out to a net. But man, Paul, that's not sexy to sell to anyone <laughs> that, hey, just, just eat enough carbs, <laughs> proteins, and fats across your week, and it might all be the same. Just like my growth hormone talk, like just take enough growth hormone, and it might all be the same. It's like, well, no, give me something real complicated. That has to be what it is, and not that nothing to knock on Justin's approach because I, there, he does extremely well with it. I think it, it probably more so caters around to psychologically, and what was below on my pyramid of calories is sustainability preferability enjoyability so if you have someone like psychology that really caters well into that rotational pattern that they, they believe in that approach they also like it more and it's enjoyable right. you're probably going to do better on that diet just as a whole um versus someone else so i think use it as a tool and don't get locked down on this is the the j3u diet approach because i have some guys where you have more aggressive of a, a cyclic pattern and some that i have on the same diet every single day so I think that's what, if you're coaching people, you, you probably need a lot of tools to use for a different type of client's psychological profile. I think Rome, we had Roman Fritz on it, and I think he made everybody's head explode, like how simple his diet is. He, he was off-season, what was it, 100 grams of protein per meal and 200 grams of carbs, contest prep, he cuts the carbs in half. That was it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's funny because I'm the same way as Roman where I want six or five identical meals and I want every day identical so that just like bullets in a clip, I don't want any variation because if there's any variation, I'll fuck it up. It's like, cause I just the same exact thing every day, all day. And I use the chronometer. Thanks, John. 
to make sure that my micronutrients are all involved. And once I threw in peas and carrots, it like shot everything up except for vitamin E <laughs> and calcium. So I just have to take vitamin E and calcium and my chicken, rice, peas and carrots covers everything. Because <laughs> you eat so much of it, you have to eventually hit these numbers. Yeah. Even trace micronutrients, if you're eating pounds of this shit, is still going to get up there. R Roman yeah. might be the only guy in the world that can contest prep on 600 grams of carbs. Yeah. <laughs> Doing yeah, those two a days too. Yeah, I mean, he he lifts twice a day. He said he might dip on later today. We'll yeah, see. He was supposed to, because I was going to have you guys talk about the differences. Because me and Roman are uh, keeping close contact about what he's exactly doing, and it's not dissimilar, but it's in some ways it's different from what you're doing. And his cycle's super simple too. Like he runs and, no orals. <laughs> we'll and this just... is your best look ever. And this was his best look ever. I think that both of you had your best years this year. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I think it keeping simple can be just fine. And uh, the basics work. A lot of people fuck up the basics, right? So yep. it's yeah, uh, that might be all there is to it. Like it's really good at deploying the basics. And I, I don't think it's like the special diet or the special drug protocol. It's probably how we're living our lives 24 seven. Yep. Nailing routine, just like you're in prep, sleep at the same time, training like an animal, like in, in progressing that, like, you doing all the basic things consistently over a long time can make you really, really good. Yeah, Justin always tells me, don't worry about the 5% if you don't have the 95 buttoned up. Yeah, it's a great thing. He has a lot of, he's a wise guy that he once told me that worrying about metformin suppressing IGF-1 is like assuming that it was the deck chair that sank the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> I was like, that is a perfect analogy. I mean, if you're throwing enough insulin and GH, you're, you're not going to have suppressed IGF-1. Well, like a lot of people say that about topical dutesteride. They're like, oh, if that gets, or like um, RU4886, it's like that's an androgen receptor antagonist. If you put it on your scalp and you microneedle a little bit, it'll get in your bloodstream. I'm like, if one milligram of an antagonist gets in your bloodstream, but you're injecting 1,400 or 2,000 milligrams of androgen agonist a week that's like taking one milligram off of testosterone like like how much higher does the binding affinity have to be but even if it was a million binding affinity and it was guaranteed that one milligram is going to bind that that it's still it may never get bumped off but that just means you're just going to grow another receptor to account for all the other fucking androgens you're putting in yeah probably John, you used to be a DC training guy, didn't you, back in the day? Yeah, that was like my first bodybuilding routine, pretty much. Yeah, I worked. I Dante. This is how old I am. I, Dante actually trained me a long time ago, like twenty oh, wow. years ago. You mean yeah, like a person? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, he was. Okay. I, I think he charged three hundred dollars a year. I think that's what it was. I don't remember. It was something ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was back before he had his supplement company. But I worked with him for like three years. But. Yeah, I eventually gave up the DC training because I'm old and my body can't take it anymore. But it it was a good transition from powerlifting for me because I chase chasing numbers. Oh, it signed me up. That made a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. it, it was good and bad, right? Because I the would log just book. <laughs> I would just chase numbers, and I could have been a lot more accurate in my form. And, yeah. and I know Dante didn't mean that. He's like, don't no, sacrifice no. your form. Right. But I, I couldn't. I couldn't pull that out. Yeah, that was all no. of us, all of us. And, and, and I think his rep ranges were just too low for a lot of the compound lifts. I feel like when you're doing six rep maxes, there's no way that you're going to be able to hold it together 100%. Exactly. One scapula is going to flare or something's going to go wrong with a six rep max on anybody. I talked to him recently, but he was saying, like, as you get older, just push the rep ranges up. Which is what I figured form. out the hard way. Yeah. Form, well, he's very, very adamant about controlling form. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, the, that no, introduce no variables in your form. I mean, it's you, just true. It, you just get better results. Like, it, and, and we are all, all of us, uh, guilty of allowing our EOs to get in the way of proper form and uh, ultimately results, you know. But I've been doing more higher volume, keeping reps in reserve type stuff over the last couple of years, and I've progressed better off of that than I ever did training to failure. It's it's pretty wild. I guess more of a renaissance periodization, like Dr. Mike Israel. I read his – have you read his book? Yeah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, man, that, that just completely kind of blew my mind open with training. And I reinvented my training a couple of years ago, and I, I've been making the best progress of my life. I kind of use the J3U tempo and exercise menu, and I use was using Isratel's approach towards things. And then me and Luke hammered out what is right now a very good system for me. I like it a lot. One thing I found was that you guys like to stick your arms out on the machine laterals. And that fucks up my left shoulder. But when I grab mm. the little dumb handles and do this rotational thing that shouldn't work, it somehow hits my middle belt better. Yeah, do it works, you know. Yep. I, I know you swear I've, by that machine. I've like, man, I've uh, come full circle in all kinds of different ways. Like I've done the ex extreme, like all out efforts to. Uh, I've done a little bit higher volume stuff, not to that extreme, but again. I have to cater to what my psychology is, which is probably is a little bit lower volume and closer proximity to failure. I, I still, uh, but again, like if you really look at it, none of us are, a lot of guys aren't training like to true failure. Then you have to define failure. It's like how, right. how, no one's crawling out of the squat rack. So no. it's, right. all of a sudden you put a stamp on it. Like, well, that was an RIR of one. People are like, oh, I'm not training like a pussy. It's like, dude, you're, it's the RIR exists, whether you want to claim it or not. Like you're still, <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's like time, right? Like it's two o'clock. You're like, fuck that. I don't count time. It's like, well, everyone else does. And it <laughs> doesn't change that it's two o'clock. It's like, you're still at an RIR of one under squat because you didn't crawl out from it. Uh, um so it's like yeah some I, things make sense to go to failure some things don't then you have a tool to move volume i think where i like i do differ a bit between renaissance is the the timeline of that volume change so i like to hold a lot of things more constant right and effort level and volume to assess and then make an escalation from there and yeah, then, that's probably more the way I do it now too i don't do it exactly the way that they do it but that's that's more the way i've been training lately so ironic i did it six months of it the way he writes it in his book and i was just a fucking mess and i didn't grow right i was doing it your way before and i was fine i switched to his way in the book it was a mess i got the app and i haven't changed it from what me and luke are doing for my volume i did what me and luke agreed to which is stay the same the whole fucking meso cycle there's no random increases but I still plug the subjective data into his app to see what it, the app tells me I should do because he wrote the algorithms. There really isn't that much volume escalation. Mm, yeah. That when it all comes down to it, half the time he's pulling volume back because it wants you to be lifting at three IRR and I'm lifting to failure on every set. I mean, what I think is failure because the form breaks down or the amplitude decreases and I go for another rep, but I cannot get this another rep with the same amount of force. Like I could throw my whole body into it, but then I'm recruiting other muscles. And that's not what the point of the exercise is. The point of the exercise is to work in, for instance, the lat, not the upper back and the lat, right? So with that type of failure in mind, if you do a form change mid set to get out an extra rep, to me, that's beyond failure. Yeah, agreed. And that your system i think is basically one rir because you're assuming you're talking to advanced or intermediate lifters whereas his book is geared towards beginners or intermediate it doesn't account for advanced lifters if you watch him train he trains pretty hard yeah yeah mike trains Which, hard it's just man it's you have to put so much context to the individual right yeah uh, of of uh, to to really you can't just make a general statement because then it's like uh, guys will just tear it apart like anything. Um, I think that's been the biggest change that in progressed my training is the the improvement in like picking right exercises for my own structure and also just like nailing form precisely to put tension where it should be. And actually, like I haven't probably got a lot stronger over that time course but there's been still like substantial improvements in, in like development in the look. Mm -hmm. my, my context now at almost 50 years old is not get hurt. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know I'm, I'm 37, but like a good leg day is like, okay, number one, I, I didn't tear a wall off. <laughs> <laughs> didn't get don't. hurt. You don't need bigger legs, but you need both of them. <laughs> you know? Because your legs are your, one of your strongest body parts. You brought yeah, your upper body sure. to catch up to your legs a lot like your adductors are legendary your hamstrings are legendary but thank god it's like that because if i had to bring my legs up i'd be screwed because yes yeah, I I mean, would, I, I've, I'm, I've torn shit and i just can't 
probably train him like uh, I'd have to train him for a totally different. Renee, my wife, she does wellness, trains legs like three to four days a week. I was like, I would never want your program. All right. I'm glad you brought that up. What the fuck happened in the last two years? How did she become the most impressive wellness competitor on the planet in two <laughs> years? That I mean, are, I know what her protocol was. I don't know what her protocol is now. And I don't know if you were comfortable because on my – normal podcasts i talk about female peds with female ped educators i had Corey on for instance and um i basically was curious as to what you're doing if you're comfortable talking about that yeah i mean i i share it all openly on on j3u it's it's funny people grab her like her pic she posts and like this girl's definitely running train and this and that it's like god <laughs> man like Re renee renee is a genetic freak like beyond even myself it's it's I've never prepped a female that's like that. Um, she didn't, she didn't, she's completely oblivious to it. I'm like, Renee, you realize <laughs> your response. Like we started prepping when I was for Tampa and she only needed like 15 weeks of actual like prep time. We ended up jumping wow. away into an earlier show because she can, she can drop fat so fast and even build muscle too. Like we started, we had a short little growth phase before prep. Um, we, we ran 12 milligrams of Anivar at and one over, day or oh. per day. Okay. Yeah. 12 milligrams per day. And her HRT is at five grams sure. of test, milligrams of test a week, not 3.5. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me give like Renee's baseline is it's a uh, right out seven milligram of testosterone per week. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. It's basically a milligram every day. Right. She'll do like one and a half. I use a growth hormone. How do you even measure that? <laughs> The test? Yeah. We, we have a, a – well, right now we have a 50 mg per mil vial, but we've had 10 mg per mil vials before too. Calm, oh, wow. I didn't even know they made such a thing. I, I, guess I actually have someone make me pharmacy. 5 mg yeah. for my patients so I can dose it at a half a milligram a day. Yeah. So the, the drug choices for an A, it's, it's all from – uh magnus hrt like so we, it's all farm grade that's why i choose anivar with her because it's farm grade right otherwise i would love to use primo but i just we can't can't trust the primo man so we uh yeah over over like a pre-prep phase like a little growth phase it was like five weeks long uh 12 milligrams of anivar per day and she dropped two pounds but man probably dropped Visually, it was like she probably dropped seven pounds of body fat. She completely recomped in this phase, dropped body fat and grew, which if we know, like to recomp, it's like so rare. Mm -hmm. right. um, but yeah, usually her off-season phases were 68-week phases of, 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 of a compound around 10 milligram per day. And so we're not going over- On seven, top of the one milligram HRT. On top of her baseline HRT that's always present. So yeah, she's- She's never going over like 70 milligram total androgen uh, of, of an additional androgen right. per week. So like even during her prep phase. 91 is what it came out to, right? Even during her prep phase, we ran that 12 milligram. Why is it 12 milligram? Because we get six milligram capsules. So that's oh, why okay. it's two pills twice a day. Um, that's what she prepped on. But yeah, like throughout her off season, we also had Renee took – almost like um was it six, 16 months off to actually take time I to remember. grow because yeah. that's what most females don't do right. dude she trains like a fucking animal um she'll go at it like not i would never want to train out to train like <laughs> she can she can take it there man like all the way there and on every set if you if you had her to and she can progress those loads up so across like that off season phase she got crazy strong on all her big basic compound lifts that with escalating her body weight up with food and then rotating in six to eight week phases of androgens with like eight weeks to 12 weeks off. That's all it took. And Renee was substantially better. Um, next, yeah, next was, go round. Night, I could not believe how good she looked right before her show. It blew yeah, my it fucking crazy. mind that I was, I think she has probably the biggest glutes in the IFBB, including the men. Yeah, she uh, she still needs more, man. Like these wellness <laughs> girls are are they're so they're, they're I think it's just the way they're put together. They're you like mean the ratio of the glute to the quad ratio needs to be greater, or do you mean she needs absolute bigger glutes and quads? 
just direct glute. So I just think direct sh- glutes. Sh- shifting some of that work to more just direct glute isolation work is what she needs. Um, that was her feedback too. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, like wellness in general just keeps upping the ante. Like these girls are, they're fucking big lower body. So what's the plan then is glute bridges before squats? Like we, we have been doing that, but honestly, right now, I, Renee might be done competing. Oh, um, she, she just doesn't get the thrill out of it. Like I do getting on stage. So she likes training and just getting strong. <laughs> and so I don't know uh, right now. I programmed her just for what she would enjoy and have fun with. But if it was to like, Hey, I, I really want to, once we get past this post-show phase, that's, that's the main thing is we will probably bring in more direct glute bridge volume, uh, kickbacks, all, all the glute isolation stuff that these females do. Um, probably a little less volume on those compound moves, like squats and leg press and, and those items. So I remember she was, uh, if I'm not, if, um, I remember, I didn't talk to her, but I thought I remember her being burnt out after the Olympia in 2021. Was, is that kind of the situation she's going through now? Uh, yeah, 21 was rough for a lot of reasons, but uh, she had like COVID after her Tampa pro win and mm. for like two weeks, basically bed bound and then had to do a six week prep into the Olympia, which man, she was down to like, I don't know, like 122 um, for her. That's probably like four pounds below what she was at at Tampa. And, mm. and that's a lot for a female. Right. So she w- she was so done. It, it was probably I think probably her worst look at the Olympia. And so that really was discouraging and it was a heavy toll on her. Um, she wanted to come back and just be, feel confident going on stage. And she absolutely did that. Like she was pumped to get on stage, felt like she you know nailed her best, but you know, looking back and just thinking she, she just needs to think through like, is it still worth pursuing? Cause it's still like very hard mentally on her to get on stage and be judged at that level. From, I don't, I don't want to get too far into like her background and, and things. So that's pretty personal. But um, it, it, we have to kind of decide for Renee if like what's best for her overall happiness and her mental health. Is that competing? Is that letting her see out the best version of herself um, or, or is it not? And so she's soaring through that right now, just enjoying training in the off season, And uh, I think she'll eventually figure out if it is getting back on stage or not. It sounds like a really healthy and intelligent approach to me. Yeah, her story overall, just from growing up without running water to being on the Olympia stage her first year, I mean, that's she could have her own movie. <laughs> Renee is so shy to talk on camera in video. Um, I, I saw Chase just ask about training videos, and she does put some up. We have some up on Animal, uh, their channel, because she, she's one of the females sponsored by them, but so – she has some some videos up in there, um, yeah. But I, I was like Renee, you got to share your, your training because it it doesn't look like any other female's training. Um, but yeah, she's she's pretty video shy. But we're, I'm trying to like break her free well, of that. I say it all the time. We need more female positive female role models on the internet. Right on. You know, we don't have any. There just aren't a lot of women that talk about bodybuilding online. I just I don't see a ton other than just posting the random. <laughs> There's nobody doing, not many doing what we do, at least. The only yeah. person I can think of, like, you know, Samantha Jeering has some pretty intense videos, and then Ashley has videos for Hostile. But I have a feeling that, you know, because I look at Renee as being one of the three key elements of J3U. You know, there's you, Luke, and Renee. I mean, it'd be really cool to have her training also featured on the podcast or on, on your YouTube channel. Um, yeah, that also- we're, 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 sh- we're shifting all the J3U stuff to its own channel to kind of like, okay, have it be J3U and not such a personal of John Jude anymore. And I'll keep my personal page. Renee will stay on there, but we're, we're doing like a J3U coaching now where we'll have like tiers of coaches and try to remove some of myself from the brand. Um, and, and bring in more educators. So we we're kind of trying to be, if, if we had like the NASM of physique competition, like that's where I'd want to head to. So, so I wanted to ask you about that too. I mean, it's one of my last three questions was. And, and just, just to let you know, I, I am 30 minutes over from what. Oh, uh, oh okay. We, oh, we can let you go, John. Um, we just. Oh, this is a selling. This is a call to action though. Um, 
So if someone was to take J3U, does that mean that they're NASM certified? And if so, for what? Yeah. So the recent thing with J3U is we did up, get the, the course, the level one course, uh, female module and the applied approach course, um, all NASM approved for CEUs. So if you're like a NASM personal trainer, ah, okay. you, you could take any one of our courses and it'll count for continuing education for, oh, cool. your, for your cert. That's Which awesome. was really cool. Like uh, I was like really worried with the PED stuff. Like, man, no way anyone's going to improve this, but they, they did. So it, it's cool really to have cool. Um, other trainers. If you want something like more in depth on that side that you could come to us. So, uh, and we do have a posing course. We are bringing on Daniel Coffey. I don't know if you've seen him. Yeah, uh, he told he me. Allowed. Yeah, he was, he actually told me when he was at your house doing it. Yeah. At, at heel with steel is his Instagram, but, um, he's about to finish PT school. He's a brain with biomechanics, but he's also just a real cool down to earth guy as well. Um, was an army ranger military background. So he's, uh, he has a nerdy side, but also is like a total bro. Like all of us just love to train. Um, but it's been great, man. The, the posing materials he started putting out was phenomenal helping people. And we're like, dude, let's put a posing course together. Like it's so, it's so needed. So that's yeah. going to come out in September. So we'll have Very him cool. on him on board too, educating on the posing side. Eventually, probably doing some of the PT corrective side of, of things as well. Right, his his content's amazing. I've known Dan since 2017. I coached him for like a year or so when he was back in the Army Rangers, and he actually was said he was taking the T4R training program and putting the Army Rangers through it. <laughs> which was i was like that was cool that i'm like the grand trainer of the army rangers that's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. That's <laughs> <laughs> claim to fame john yeah. really thank you for coming on man it was yeah, a man. blast we hanging out with you we appreciate you coming on todd and colin you want to hang out for a couple questions that yeah sure yeah, yeah, we, we, we accrued a few questions today <laughs> yeah we sure did yeah guys uh thanks again for having me on and yeah thank you uh, for coming I, on. I would love to do this with y'all again i like just the other great group of guys just to hang out with and i Love all, all your content that, but, that y'all put out too. Oh, really? we kept it Thank you. we kept it high class today. We're yeah. usually a little more lowbrow doing our best behavior, but next time, <laughs> oh, let's let's drag it through the mud next time. <laughs> well, you said anal before we did, so I was like, totally not. It's a record. Yeah. I was like, me and Paul, I lost listen. money on that. Actually, John won't come on. We're too lowbrow. We make some See, jokes. I, I love getting away with my like serious like comments because people like we don't know if he's joking or not. Yeah. They're like, yeah, man, I'm I'm totally laid back, like in easygoing, but. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'd love to hang out with y'all some other time. Awesome. Are you going to be at Swiss, man? No, I, I won't be. I won't all be. right. Yeah, I guess it's a little close to the Olympia. We're all going to be there. But anyway, John, thank you for coming on, man. We appreciate you. Appreciate it, man. Okay, guys. Later. All thank right, you. Yeah. Take care. All right. I nuked some of the questions, so maybe they might be gone now. I, I, I didn't I, think they applied I, to John. Started, I started a bunch of questions. Uh, yeah, I, I took some of them off. Uh, um, anyway, well, that's all good. Well, we had a couple of people who paid. Uh, yep, let's grab so those. Let's, let's run through those first. Uh, George um, says he's on a carb cycling diet and he's running a cycle of 750 tests, 600 mass, 600 MPP, training five days a week. Uh, he's got two non training days. I'm at 150 to 300 grams of carbs. Like uh, yes. Okay. Thank you for translating that for me. And then three days, uh, 500 grams of carbs, two days, 900 grams of carbs. Yep. Up from 200, two weeks ago, six weeks into the program with Humalog. When do I add a third high day? And should he do Humalog on the third high day? I, like with the third high day, like I, I, I don't know when I'm programming diets for clients, I only save that for like the hardest of hard gainers. Like if you're, if you're, body composition is looking okay at two i would keep it at two i i have a hard time pushing that much food all the time too so i mean i, I a lot of it's subjective man it just depends on how your what your body composition is looking like like i i like the super hard gainers the super skinny guys sometimes i will push more high days but i think two is sort of the sort of the median um i, I don't know i mean how what, what how you would do it Todd but that's generally generally how I'm approaching it with my clients what I would do is and this is what I did with Justin in this situation was I would go Monday Wednesday Friday were training days and high days and then the other days would be somewhere between low and medium 
So if I was going to do three high days, everything else has to be a low day. There can't really be a medium day. I mean, I'm training six days a week. Right. So. In your case, it doesn't make sense. I would, If I was you, I'd be doing two, maybe three high days a week, and all the other training days are medium days, and I'd have one low day. I would say the majority of my off-season, Justin, had me on two high days, four or five medium, one low day is what, what I was doing. Um, I, I did there for a while go up to three when I cranked the growth hormone up because it seemed like when I cranked the growth hormone up, I just kept losing weight. <laughs> It was it was pre pretty wild, um, but yeah, it a lot of it. I would just go by your body composition, man. Like people get focused on the numbers with the carbs and stuff. I I, I try to push it as high as I can go without getting fat, but you don't want to turn into a sloppy pig, <laughs> you know. So there 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 is a fine line um, there. So that would be my my advice on that. Also, that's a lot of MPP too. I would think I would. I was thinking I use, the same thing. I, I didn't really like the ratio. No, I'd probably run the NPP about half of that. You could just redistribute it, go 900 tests, 750 mast, 300 NPP. Or something yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's, I probably would run it something like that. Um, cool. that would, um, all right, you want to grab another Thanks, one? George. I like the picture, very professional. Yeah, it was like a LinkedIn picture. <laughs> I, I was so worried about being unprofessional with John on, but he said, and then he cool. dropped the A bomb. I was just like, all <laughs> right, we're gonna be monetized. <laughs> now we don't give a shit. <laughs> I feel bad I he did that for us because I've never seen him go anywhere close to that. Then he did the oral and hard joke. I was like, all right, <laughs> he, he actually does watch this, so he knows. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad he likes our content. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I feel bad, Scott. We didn't get a chance to bring a question on while we still had John. Um, but he was wondering what his thoughts might have been on holding phases after I'll tell massing. You my thoughts. Necessary. Yeah, I figure we'll get we we'll get we we'll get you can get sloppy seconds here because John's gone now. But he uh, is. <laughs> I know this for a fact. He's a big advocate of after a grow phase before you do a mini cut, you should do a holding phase. Otherwise, you'll mini cut off what you just grew. Yep, I would 100% agree with that. That's been my experience too. Cool. I get a lot of guys that get panicky coming out of uh, cuts. They think they're getting too fat and they, or come a bulk, and they immediately <laughs> want to transition into a cut. And almost every time I've ever done that, they end up losing everything they they gained. And that's um, Isretel does push that. They're doing a mini cut in the middle of a bulk. John typically does not. I don't like that approach. He usually has you a holding phase, even a de-escalation of gear to 30 to 50%. Well, you think I, about like with satellite cell proliferation, I mean, how long does that take? Three, four months? Right. There's a delay. Yeah. And then this is something me and Justin Compton talked about years ago, um, was you get about, if you only go six months and then come go right into a cut, you lose it all. You need to do, even though you stop growing after about four to six months, you need to make that off season nine months in order to keep the gains. Then you can do your cut. And I know that that's a very specific thing and it kind of sounds bro sciencey, but it's, you know. Well, Justin we're all Compton, about bro science here. Justin Compton's <laughs> one of the best physiques. World's all leading. <laughs> World's leading bro science podcast. You can't, you can't argue with that cleft chin. <laughs> have you ever seen this cleft chin it's like he's got like a 36 triple d chin it's just like <laughs> like Justin a cartoon Tom. character like dudley do right or something your uh, shirt was a big hit uh today oh really uh, yeah oh, we've had like people want to know if they can if you can show it fully oh yeah uh if you make todd's screen big paul they want to see his uh, shirt. Yeah, hang on. Let me let me give him. Uh, there we go. People want to see the whole thing, Todd. They want to know where they oh. can where they can procure such a. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a button up too. I know. Yeah. yeah, they were saying uh, that, that clearly you were on your best behavior for John. That is a classy metal shirt. With your, is, with your, it's with like your classy if you shirt. And... To, if you wanted to go on a job interview that you didn't want, <laughs> this is the shirt you wear. It's like Sexito <laughs> from uh, Step Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Where did you sure. get that out at a festival? No, I got it online. I was just like, I don't wear enough metal shirts to be doing a sub show called Drugs and Deathcore. So I, start, I Googled death metal shirts 
and you know you get the unicorn. I need one of those. With the death metal in pink, like they took it too literally. Google takes it too literally. So I had to individually type different band names in, and I actually found that there's a whole bunch of Misery Index shirts made by some third party ch- Chinese thing called Goth shirts, and it has what looks like to be like a heroin junkie straight out of rehab who looks unhappy wearing the misery index shirts and i was like he does that that this looks weird that that he looks so unhappy but i got like a misery index shirt i got a blue tank top that had like some creepy sigils on it and i got this and they didn't i i mean behemoth has a lot of really good apparel but the thing is when you get shirts online you don't know what fabric it's going to be and yeah, this and is actually kind of like some spandex fabric so it actually fits really good but it's hot as fuck like it's I also tight on the biceps, it's loose in the waist. It, it stretches rather than tears when you actually do a lat spread. I also have some morality. Like I kind of want some of it to go to the artist. Like I think a lot of it is just rip off stuff. <laughs> You're talking about Justin Compton. This is this is what the full off season look looks like. <laughs> All right. Well, that's full off season. But when he turned pro in 2012, that was. Yeah, I'm. I'm like. I'm saying that. That's what an off season looks like. Yeah. Yeah, he looked yeah, up Justin, there. See, like, look at that chin. You totally would buy a car from that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I would give up my lunch money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you take it. <laughs> you need it more country. than me. <laughs> but that is a very masculine looking chin, man. Having that cleft there. The powerful That's butt funny. chin. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, anyway. <laughs> Um, all right, another question here. We'll, we'll get one or two more in. Sure. I was just running through. Um, I, I didn't say yeah. anything offensive today. That's no, like, man. You're, no, you're, man. That's a record. You got you were 19 good. minutes left. Uh, Sean wants to know, he said, when I was 14 to 16, my doctor had me on 2.5 milligrams letrozole per day for two years to allow more time to grow. I felt awful. No blood work done and he wants to know, might he have any long-term side effects from this? Yeah, you're taller. This is a theory I came up with a long time ago, that it's estrogen that causes it. Well, this isn't my theory. This is a fact. The estrogen causes the growth plates to fuse. So an anti-estrogen in, in a teenager would actually make teenagers taller. So would I have given up? Be, well, I mean, it, most middle schoolers are miserable anyway. So I think if you're going to be miserable, <laughs> I will be really miserable and be a few inches taller when you're an adult. So I wish I had your doctor. My doctor didn't treat me for shit. And it was like, I don't know whether or not your growth plates were still open between 14 to 16. That may, I mean, most people still grow, but that wasn't the optimal time. 2.5 milligrams of letrozole per day is insanely high dose. Oh my God. I did that on my first prep. I felt awful. One milligram of Rimidex would have been 97% suppression. 2.5 letrozole is 99% suppression aroma would, it... would have been 65 percent suppression i would think less aroma stain would have been more um aroma stain would have been a little bit more merciful but I don't, taller. I don't know what it is about letrozole but it makes me feel like somebody punched me in the face oh it's horrible and it actually just make you feel like shit yeah i'm de- I- i'm debating like like trying to get away without them on my prep this year you don't just, need them you, yeah you, Use like what John did was um, use six times the master on if you're not. That's yeah. about as you're actually don't be in the toilet, but it won't be on AIs. John didn't use a single AI that whole prep, and he looks fucking shredded. That's I don't think Roman wild. did either. I can ask him, but all right, let's grab another one here. Let's see here. Um... I'm glad I made those questions because I was expecting Roman to come on. I figured, oh, no, these questions, we won't ask any of these questions. I still had some left, too. Yeah. Let's see. Well, important one. I wish we could have gotten it on while uh, Colton was still on stream. Colton uh, said T- he, his computer died. Tito, uh, I'm sorry. Tito, no. no, Colton, are you single? Dude, if you... He's literally got his girlfriend in his profile. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> uh, I just, Everybody like, loves Colton. Dream on Tito. Keep keep hope alive. But Colton he's, is he's the, attached. Col- Col- Colton is the ginger god. Yeah. 
We love you, Coach Colton. <laughs> we love you, Coach Colton. <laughs> oh. oh, shit. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, do you guys want a, a training question or a – Sure, a training. training? All right. Got Max M. Uh, I am progressing really well on certain body parts, usually all back movements as well as quads and hamstrings exercises, but I stall pretty quickly on pushing movements. Do you have any adjustment suggestions for me? You guys got any tips, uh, good cues um, for pushing movements? Might to... be going too heavy. I find most men bench way too fucking heavy. Mm -hmm. That They'll do 8 to 10 reps, to, or they'll do like 10 to 12 reps on everything, but their bench is 5 to 7. So then you start getting neurological damage when you get injured because something hurts, and then the, that pain shuts the nervous system down at the spinal cord. So even though consciously you're not pulling Interesting. Back, your nervous system is saying, fuck this, it hurts. I'm not going to push into something that hurts. Right, right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I feel like you just described what I like my approach to benching when I and the the, re the results of, <laughs> of, of said approach. <laughs> like, yeah, free man. I feel very targeted uh, you, right now. <laughs> you ever notice the guys that have huge bench presses never have big pecs? They never have big pecs. Yeah, it's uh sure. and I think a lot of guys press with their front delts in their triceps, not their not their chest. Especially power lifters. It's yeah. all biceps and front delts because it's down here. Right. Yep. They're benching like it's a bench shirt without the bench shirt. They've got so, the yeah. arc, the yeah. belly, they're on their toes, and then they're doing a tricep press, yeah. but there's no bench shirt. So if there's, you're not actually – it doesn't make any sense. So I guess for but, Max, what, what would we tell him? Keep, make sure that you're not benching more than you should be. Um, and, uh, I don't know, keep your elbows in. <laughs> I got yeah. better results when I walked, when I gave up on the bench and I switched to a machine and I took the machine with the same lack of ego that I take my back training to. Well, yeah. Well, so so Colton. 10 to 12 reps really did a number for my chest because now I'm going and then dumbbells, dumbbells. You can't have any ego about dumbbell pressing because by the time they're heavy, you can't get them up. Yeah. So you pretty much have to work at 10 to 20, 11 to 20 rep range with dumbbells. And you can really control each movement so you can squeeze the exact part of your chest you want. Yep. You oh, can get I really like to do with dumbbells or is uh, your chest that way. Get a, uh, a tripod with my cell phone, set that up, and then uh, have friends hand me dumbbells that are heavier than I should be holding. <laughs> uh, and then for the camera, really struggle to get maybe one, 1. 1.5 reps. I feel like that for me has really generated yeah. the best growth. Yeah, the hash What did you, what, you say? What do you get? What do you guys dumbbell press? Oh, I haven't, I haven't dumbbell pressed in a while, but what, yeah, for, for I was short, doing the chest. One... I'm sorry, Paul. Yes. I, I left off at the 150s. I mean, that's as heavy as our gym has, but I don't even, I don't even dumbbell press any. I haven't, I'm only machine pressing anymore. My best ever was 110 incline for 11, but right now I'm doing 75 incline for like 12, and it's they were slow before, but they're even slower now. Yeah, you I do a lot of tempo work, so that makes sense. Yeah, everything I do is slow. Mm -hmm. I think I pressed like 120s uh, back when I was strong. Yeah, I was still in the work. <laughs> I don't even fuck with them anymore. Nah, I don't, and, I, and I like I think barbell bench presses. Just throw those in the trash if you're a bodybuilder. Yeah, you just you don't even need a flat bench. Yeah. It is, uh, like I, a, I agree. Flat bench. You're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> Diverging <laughs> arms instead of converging arms yeah. makes no sense. Yeah, you pretty you, much it, want a, a chest press machine with converging arms or dumbbells. Colin, uh, you talk about the camera flat. thing. You, you talk about the camera thing, man. Mm -hmm. I had some. 18 year old at the gym the other night i'm probably gonna hurt some feelings ask me to spot him well, i'm guessing this um, was when i was with, not there yeah when you were not there with dumbbells <laughs> and he had he had the, he was doing the 90s on a shoulder press and i'm looking at him i'm like dude you weigh half as much as me what are you doing <laughs> and he had his camera set up and oh, and he's like can you help me get these up and, and, and i'm like like he was like puffing his chest man and he his reps were about I, I had to help him get it all the way up on the first rep and then he was like bringing it down to like the top of his forehead and back yeah. up and i'm just that's he wild. probably caught me shaking my head and rolling my eyes in his in his video that's great Dude, and you know he's yeah. probably still gonna post it 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing, man? I wouldn't have spotted him if I'd known that was going that was going to happen. Yeah. That I've never had a girl walk up to me and said, "Oh my god, that was so impressive. Can I blow you?" So I don't know why the fuck guys do that. It's really only guys that look at you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say if you're squatting a lot in a video and a girl lifts, she might make a comment that that was a good squat video, like that was good depth and that kind of stuff. But I've never had a situation where you're showing off with dumbbell presses no. and you're impressing any girls. No, the standard question I get every time I go to my daughter with my daughter to a high school sporting event from all the high school boys is how much Look do you that. bench press, bro? Yeah. And the look on their face when I tell them I don't bench press, <laughs> I have no idea. You're like what? That's all I like. They're like what? <laughs> How's that possible? <laughs> there I go. It, it's weird that people care so much about that one. It's almost like it's how you know they don't lift. Yeah, is that they ask about this one lift that doesn't? I have a, a lot of people ask me how much I eat. That's the one thing I get a lot. Yeah. I yeah, I mean, people. I don't know. It seems like young guys are obsessed with protein shakes. They're asking me, "What what protein shake do you like?" And I'm like, "None of them." Them. them." Everyone's looking for a shortcut. That's what I don't know nice. if you guys saw the Instagram really did. I interviewed a random guy at the gym, and I was like, mm -hmm. "What's the best source of protein?" And his first answer was like a protein shake. I'm like, "I did yeah, see yeah, that one." That. Yeah. Who, who would you? Who? Just some random. It's guy. Not atypical. Yeah. Of people in that demographic. Some, some in random one year old, and he's just like protein shakes. And I was thinking like beef, eggs, you know, like something actually nutritious. It's like protein shake okay I, I love when i take on new clients and i'll have them send me their current diet and they're they're drinking four protein shakes yeah. a day <laughs> I, I literally had I, I i probably shouldn't talk about this but i have one guy send me his thing he was doing four protein shakes and then his other two meals were quest bars no. Oh my God, he's doing. <laughs> it's like a not committed bikini girl. Diet. I used he's, to. There's this girl I used to know. She like, said Quest bars and Bang Energy drinks was her whole diet. <laughs> I was just like, what the fuck? I'm like, how much protein are you eating, dude? And he's like, plenty, plenty. And I'm like, well, let's see what you. Let's see what everything looks like. I also get the guys on contest prep that aren't losing weight, and I'm like, all right, dude, send me the list of everything you're eating, and I'll go through it. And I'm just like, oh, Lord. it's atrocious. Sometimes I won't like when I initialize work with a client, I won't have them have a diet. I'll just say track what you're eating. I want to see what yeah, it looks like. I do that too. I think that's yeah. smart. And it's like, oh, every time I'm like, how are you like who told you to do this? It's right. crazy. It's like yeah, I do that with my lifestyle clients. Like I, I would assume that somebody who's competed in bodybuilding knows what the fuck they're doing. Maybe, maybe maybe that's too far of a leap. So like I usually just give those guys macros. But my lifestyle clients, it's exactly what I do. I have them grab uh, a macro tracking app and then send me the reports every week, and then I'll I'll go through yeah. it and I'll I'll have sort of macro goals for them, and I'll tell them what to clean up and don't yeah. eat this, eat that. You know, this this is shit. This is not. It always trips me out, Paul, is when you tell me you talk to people who can't even be bothered to, you know, you say like, OK, I need you to, to eat this many grams of protein at this meal. And, and they can't figure out how much chicken that is, for example, how much yeah. chicken breast that is. Like, and I'm like, in, in, in this year of our Lord, 20 and 23, Jesus, I God literally Christ, had a guy la last week that couldn't figure out how many how much chicken on the scale was was 50 grams of protein like, i'm like straight up just you google can it. ask that question to google yeah, like google is a person <laughs> wait i'm so confused you put it on the scale and it, and you keep taking the chicken on or off until it hits 50 no he didn't know how much to put on the scale to get 50 grams of protein right, exactly. trial and error yeah I, that's just like track with a mac but he didn't and know how to make the conversion like you know like there's yeah. two point you know or 3.1 grams look, of, I, I, I love todd like struggling to understand the depth of stupidity we're, you know, we're dealing with here there are literally scales <laughs> have you seen the scales you can buy now have you seen those macro you scales you can plug? and it yeah. just converts it from ounces to that's gram. what i'm saying it is that simple it should be that simple and it's like, like I you, got people clearly you've never sold drugs if you can't convert <laughs> 28 grams to an ounce because have you seen it, these macro scales? the metric system is the only way to sell drugs yeah. let me see i have started to see those ma macro scales paul yeah being uh, advertised what are they? wait what it's there's scales uh, that are dumbed down for people who don't know the uh, metric system. i will show you, you get them on amazon the they're about 100 cool. bucks um, I'll show it to you, but you can literally. No way! I can't believe this. 
that the, this is what bikini girls did for the industry. So, so literally, you put out. in, you pick the food, you plug it in, and it that, spits out all the macros that's for you. That's you don't crazy. even have to do anything. Wait, wait. How is this? That's different? actually pretty cool. I'm not even gonna lie. That's pretty fucking mm-hmm. cool. Wait, what? You choose your food. Oh, food code 1464 avocado. That's a, that's not a, an image. That's the fucking scale has an LED nutrition facts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, with with like a that's a scale with an avocado half on it and with the food code 1464. It's, yeah, the you can that. get them for Oh, this one's 50 bucks. Yeah. That's, that's pretty, pretty cool. cool. Oh, you better hope That might be a right. good uh, option for some of these mental giants. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to get this for the conversion. for the idiots that can't do math. But it doesn't mean that they're Okay, but that whatever software it's using may not be the same software you're using because there's no consensus about nutrition. They, they basically chronometer would have to be the software they're using in chronometer. It's all relative. Like, like I, like the way I look at it, as long as they're consistent in their that's, measurement, if I tell them to reduce their, their, their calories by 10%, it's going to result in a net difference, right? It doesn't matter. As long as they're consistent in their methodology, for measurement, yeah. it doesn't fucking matter. I had a guy wouldn't he didn't want to work with me because he said Jesus never meant for us to track macros. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I like that argument because it can be applied to so many things. <laughs> I, I, lo- I love the people. I can't. I can't read this email. Jesus never meant for us to read emails. I, <laughs> I, w- I was talking to somebody. Uh, I have a post coming up about this, but I was talking to somebody, uh, just a friend. Um, a friend of a friend who was telling me, Hey, I need help with my diet. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in a calorie deficit and I'm not losing weight. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, I'm like, are you weighing and measuring everything? And she was like, no, I'm not weighing and measuring anything, weighing everything. I'm like, well then how do you know if you're in a calorie deficit? Yeah. You're just, guessing. you're just guessing. Yeah. That's when you fire them as a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you don't, you don't know. Like, there's like Jesus Christ, man. Weigh your shit. That's the only way you. If you're not measuring, you don't know. You're just guessing. There was that study. Um, crap, I, I forget who did it, but I saw Lane Norton post it where they they had a group of obese people and a group of normal weight people, and they uh, they did a reporting on how bad they over or underestimated their calories. The people that were of normal weight were within 10% of the margin of error on the calories. And the people that were obese were off by like 75%. Yeah, the calories. <laughs> That's ridiculous. awesome. So that basically what that study says is that fat people are fat because they're stupid. Mm. Well, no, it was because they food choices like, are, are, but it might you know, be like, yeah, I mean, the, well, they the, said they only found about a five percent on average. Uh, I think it was five percent on average different in, difference in metabolism between the obese. <laughs> But like the obese people probably eating things that, you know, would stop them from getting full and they just keep eating. Yeah. Well, they've, they, you know, like what what they found is like, if they thought they ate, uh, you know, 30 grams of food X, they actually were eating 60. Oh, so it wasn't that they miscalculated the conversion that they misestimate how much they actually ate. Yeah. They thought they had 10 chips, but they had 17 chips. Correct. Okay. Yeah, they were underreporting their food. They they didn't. Uh, they, they deliberately told them not to weigh and measure their food. Right. Um. So, but they they were they had people. Um. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. It's pretty Fat pretty interesting. People can't eyeball. Or they just think that you know they just uh, it, it. I have a feeling you know I think it's a little deeper than that. I think it's just hunger hormone signaling is, is that's different. what I, exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. About. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But, yeah, and you're probably not eating satiating foods either, you know. Like, which I mean, what it, Alan said. right? Is it? It's pretty hard chips, getting fat eating overeat. potatoes and chicken breasts. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you when can't. you see, ob- I, I see ob- an obese person, and and you know, I just I see someone who's uh, overfed but undernourished. Right. You know, if they I were see. eating more nourishing foods, they wouldn't be eating as much, and you know, they'd be less inflamed. They perhaps might be more inclined to take a little walk here and there, and then you know, you're, before you know it, you're you're in a you know, maybe no longer in the morbid obesity range, and you're more in the range of like a, just a normal fat American. What what, what is it like? Uh, uh, Twelve M and M's is about equivalent of what uh, a, a twelve ounce uh, baked potato is, or some, some <laughs> shit like that. I don't. I don't even want to know that information. I think that just one Oreo. <laughs> the glass of wine is worth twelve apples. Like that's. Just oh my gosh! To think about. But how yeah. many grapes? Yeah. 
All right, gentlemen, I need to wrap this up. And we we hit the two hour mark. I, I we wow. kept John thirty minutes over. <laughs> That's all. Uh, he chose to stay. He was turning into a pumpkin. Uh, I was I was so infuriated before I got on here too. My goddamn camera broke, so I'm using my stupid so webcam. Funny. I wish people saw it. I've never seen Paul Mad in five years. I've never seen Paul Mad. He was livid. It was adorable. My uh, <laughs> my, my uh, you know thousand dollar DSLR shit the bed before. <laughs> It was just like if Ned Flanders stuck his toe. It was just like the best. <laughs> mother. <laughs> like, do that. All right, folks. I appreciate you guys watching. Thank you for hitting us up on another episode of Anabolic Bodybuilding Live. Thanks for hanging out.